I would like to introduce the one you actually came here to hear speak. So, um, so we're welcoming Dr. Rob Carter from uh, Creation Ministries International. Uh, Dr. Carter is a senior scientist and speaker for CMI USA in Atlanta, Georgia, and is currently researching human genetics and other issues related to biblical creation. Rob obtained his PhD in marine biology from the University of Miami. He has done, gener he has gen done genetic studies of pigmentation in corals and other invertebrates, plus designing and building an agricultural, an no, oh, an aquaculture, excuse me, an aquaculture facility for uh, Caribbean uh, corals. So with that, let's welcome Dr. Rob Carter. Someone has a switch somewhere? Do I have a switch? Um, let me see. Oh, it's on, okay. Now it's working. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Uh, I am Robert Carter, as you now know. I am speaker for Creation Ministries International, and I am going to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects. Did it just cut out? Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to talk to you about, <laughs> about one of my favorite subjects. I just want to have to talk loud. Um, I am a marine biologist turned geneticist. I cut my teeth studying corals and then fish and then genes and I did some genetic engineering. And since then I have been, basically what I do is I write computer programs like I spent all day today doing to analyze data. And I'm trying to think of things in genetics that evolutionists don't necessarily think of because they left some low hanging fruit behind. I try to find those places and say, ah, I think I got something there and study that. And I've actually had several publications, uh, even since I came to work for CMI, in the secular literature and genetics. So I am a practicing scientist, and I just love what happens inside the cell. Most of this is going to be not about ATP or ATP synthase, but about genetics, because that's where my focus is. So I was in graduate school in Miami. It's a tough life having to scuba dive for a living. Uh, and I was studying these beautiful animals. The, these corals under high magnification, the polyps, I mean, the polyps are only like that big. So this is a big magnifier thing, expensive microscope, take these photographs. They glow under ultraviolet light. And that's bizarre. And I started studying the, these pigments, saying, what are these things? And all, I'm doing all these chemical extractions and nothing was working until I did a protein extraction. And I found out that those are proteins that cause these animals to glow under ultraviolet. You're made of proteins and you don't glow. <laughs> so this is very weird. But once I realized it's a protein, I reason is a protein, there's a gene behind the protein. And when I stole the gene from these animals and engineered them into these animals, that's when I got my doctorate. <laughs> but a lecture on genetic engineering is for another day. I'm actually going to give one at our super conference in Myrtle Beach at the end of this May, if you want to come. Um, that just, I just opened up a giant can of worms and we'll save that for some other time. I'm just trying to establish the fact that I am a, a geneticist and a scientist, so I might know a little bit. I don't know a lot, but I might know a little bit about what I'm about to try to explain. I'm going to try to explain how you work on the inside. How your genome, which is basically a giant computer program, how it functions. The problem is, genetics is not simple. And all the ideas we had in the 1900s and the late 1800s about genetics have turned out to be wrong. Everything you learned in school, throw it away. We have to rethink everything. And the, the reason for that is that DNA is much more complex than anyone thought. It is a surprise even to the creationists how complex the system of regulation in our cells is. But we have to define a couple of terms here. And uh, if, I, if I use a big word that you've never heard, just kind of go like that and I'll see it. If someone does that, I'll say, okay, I'll stop, I'll back up and I'll define it. But I've used DNA, here's a picture of a DNA molecule. I, I'm gonna use the word genome a lot. So let me define a genome. You have many different genes. They're miniature computer programs coded into your DNA. 
put them all together, and that's called a genome. But your genome is broken up into pieces. You have six feet of DNA inside every one of your cells. So your cells that are microscopic have a molecule six feet long, except it's broken up into multiple molecules. You have 23 normal chromosomes. And outside that, there's a, a mitochondrial chromosome we'll talk about a little bit. But your chromosomes, which are pieces of your genome, come in pairs because you got one genome from your mother and one genome from your father. That's why you're half mom and half dad. But if you look at this photograph that when cells divide, the, the chromosomes condense. And when they're condensed, you can take a photograph of that and cut the pictures, cut these out and line them all up. It's called a karyotype. This is the way they used to diagnose Down syndrome because one of those chromosomes would have an extra little piece on it. Say, oh, there's an abnormality there. But these karyotypes are really interesting. This photograph was taken from a man. And I can tell that instantly because the last two chromosomes there on the bottom right aren't paired. Females have two X chromosomes. Men have a Y chromosome and an X chromosome. I remember in college being taught that the Y chromosome is a vestigial piece of junk DNA. It has hardly any genes on it. It's mostly just repetitive short sequences of DNA. And that's true. But now we know better because we've realized that the Y chromosome is a master control switch. And that in fact, one particular gene on the Y chromosome triggers the action or affects the action of thousands of other genes on all of the other chromosomes. And it has a very profound effect. Men and women are not the same. We don't think the same. We don't look the same. We don't act the same. Most of that is driven by the substance called testosterone. And starting in utero, the male embryo is dosed with testosterone higher than the female. And what results is a very different form of a person. Boys and girls aren't the same. The difference is caused by the Y and the X chromosome. Okay. I just skidded around a very difficult uh, area, as you notice. <laughs> Um, yeah, now, I don't want to get to politics. I don't want to get into culture, but I really want to get to politics and culture. I mean, particular Supreme Court justice. Who just got <laughs> yeah, anyway. <clears throat> Sorry, shouldn't have gone there. <laughs> 20 years ago, the Human Genome Project was completed. I was in graduate school, was nearing the end of my graduate school, and I was very excited because we finally were gonna know, right? They predicted the reason that they got the government to spend $3 billion, the justification was, we'll be able to cure disease. You know how many diseases have been cured by our knowledge of the genome? None, because the genome was not what we thought. Back then we had the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. Here's a piece of DNA, it makes a protein. That's not true. And on and on and on. Today, the thousand uh, genome, thousand dollar genome is available. It costs us $3 billion to make the first genome. I had my genome sequence on a Black Friday special by an organization called Dante Labs for $295. In fact, I got it right here on my laptop and folder. 295 bucks. Everything has changed. DNA sequencing is trivial. And in the very near future, most of all of you will have your genome on file with your doctor. It costs nothing to get your genome sequenced. It costs everything to get it interpreted. The doctor will see, be sitting there going, okay, we're going to give you this drug. Oh, no, no, you've got, okay, we're going to give you this drug because that matches this gene that you're carrying. Me, right around the corner, literally today. And for some of you tomorrow, maybe a couple of years from now, it's, it's gonna hit us very quickly. Personal genomics and medicine is a really cool thing. Thing is, um, the genome does a lot of different things. One thing it does, it controls biochemistry. That goes on essentially forever. Each one of those molecules that's pictured 
has an arrow connecting one molecule to the other. And almost every one of those arrows is a blue leg. There's one leg kinase, nucleoside diphosphate kinase. There's a, a something else I can't even read. There's tons of blue words there. Each blue word is a protein, an enzyme that converts one chemical to another. And these enzymes are the envy of all organic chemists because our bodies can do things we cannot do in a test tube. Our bodies can remove one atom from a molecule and replace it with another. Very fast with exquisite perfection and precision. Show you another biochemistry one. There's not just a genome, there's also something called a proteome. That's all the proteins in your body. There's also an interactome. That's the interactions amongst all the proteins in your body. Well, this is a map of the interactome of one third of the proteins discovered in a fruit fly. It's a map, so it's just a representation. In green in the middle, there's a proteins that are in the nucleus. In blue, those are proteins that are in the cytoplasm. Yellow are membrane proteins and extracellular proteins. You can see there's a square. Let me turn on my laser pointer here. You can see there's a square cutout and it zooms up and then another square cutout and it zooms up again. So here's a protein. There's a line connecting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight others I count, I think. That protein matches eight other proteins. These are the, the proteins I showed you in the last slide. Eight other ones, but it's not just like they bump into each other, they match like a lock and a key. So if this was a, a chemical and this chemical need to be controlled, well, one protein would come and open up the battery compartment. Another one would come and shove new batteries in there. Another one would come turn it on, turn it off. Another one would come and do that to silence it. Another one come and break it in half and dispose of it. And they fit perfectly like locks and keys. Wait a minute. Eight different locks and eight different keys? That's really complicated. Worse, if you break one of those links, change the protein shape a little bit, you're more than likely going to kill the fruit fly. Most of those links are absolutely essential to life. Some of them you can change, absolutely. Those are the ones we see. Things we can change, height, weight, hair color, eye color, skin color, basic shapes of things, but you can't change biochemistry. That's when you get sickle cell anemia. That's when you get tie socks. That's when you get all these other hereditary bad things. So yeah, some things you can change, but most you can't. But if that's true, how did the fruit fly evolve to this position? And once it's in that position, how does it evolve any further? Evolution is constrained by what's allowable and what's survivable. And what's survivable doesn't lead to the origin of new life forms. We're just seeing slight modifications of what already exists. And consider that the human interactome is at least 10 times more complicated than a fruit fly. And all of a sudden, this whole human evolution thing is becoming really problematic. If life were simple, evolution might be possible. That is true. The more complex life becomes, the less possible evolution is. That is also true. Life is absolutely complicated. That's the only thing we've learned about biology over the last 50 years or so. It's a sheer complexity of life and how shockingly complex it is. So is evolution true? I submit to you the genome is not simple. In fact, it is the most complex computer operating system in existence. And the human genome is more complicated than any genome of any other species that we know of. <clears throat> but it's also not just a, a, a chemical. It's not just one strand of DNA. It's, it, it actually changes. It changes shape. It recodes itself. It actually operates in four dimensions. Now, I'm going to go through each of the four dimensions now. Think of computer programmers, right? They like write in lines of code. You've heard that, right? A line of code. What's a line in mathematics? It's a one-dimensional object. It has length, and that's it. 
So if our computers write, we write in lines of code, but our genome operates in four dimensions, yeah, genomes and computers aren't really the same thing, but we can try to compare them. Here we have a comparison of the production or the, the regulation of protein manufacturing in, in an E. coli bacterium on the left. And on the right is the call graph for the Linux operating system. On the left, we see E. coli has a certain number of genes up here on the top. And then you have a certain number of genes and proteins and things that control the operation of these genes. And altogether, they have all these different protein outputs. But our computers operate differently. We have, I'm going backwards here, aren't I? No, 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 I, I'm the, sorry, excuse me. I had, I, my brain just skipped the beat. Our computers are less complicated than the bacterium. I, I, my, I had my, back, my thinking backwards. I couldn't understand this graph. Now I got it. The bacteria have a few genes controlling a few important middle operators that have a large number of outputs. Our computers tend to have a lot of very important subroutines that do a lot of calculating to have a very few number of outputs. We're backwards, we're inefficient. We don't work very well when we compare how well life works. Well, life is fine-tuned to be incredibly efficient. Our computers aren't because we're not smart enough to program like God programmed life. But if we work, I mean, think of uh, the operating system on my laptop here. This Windows 11, can't stand this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Billions of man hours of developmental time went into producing this operating system. Because we're all beta testers. Trillions of hours have gone into getting this thing to work as well as it does, and it still crashes all the time. Correct. And if it takes that much work to get something that hardly works, works kind of well, but except when you want it to, you know, it's, it's, it's just annoying, right? But bacteria work incredibly well all the time and they've been cranking out great working bacteria for now 6,000 years and there's no hint that they're ever going to fall apart die and go extinct because they're very well designed okay sorry about getting that backwards so the first dimension of dna is a linear string of letters for example this is the human y chromosome C T A A C C C T A A C C C T A A C C C T A A C C C. Oh boy, that's boring, isn't it? It's very repetitive. That goes on for sixty million letters. So it's hard for humans to comprehend stuff like this. Let's do something different. Some friends of mine wrote a computer program, which was genius. They replaced each of the letters with a colored dot. Four letters, four colors. That on the left is a human Y chromosome. That gray area, that's a section that until just last week, we weren't able to sequence. It was so repetitive that the sequencing machines couldn't get through there. But look at this, can you see how there's a repeat here? There's like one, two, three, four, wraps around, three, four, you see that? And every once in a while there's a little deletion, so the repeat skips a little bit to the left. And down here there's another repeat, and over here there's another at different lengths. That's really interesting patterns leap out at humans when we see things like that because we have got an analytical computer up here that can do amazing things we just see it i don't necessarily know what all that repetition is for some of the genome because only you know two percent of the genome actually codes a protein what does the other 98 percent do well, there's a lot of regulation happening in that 98 percent that controls the two percent but not only that, not all of it is necessary for protein manufacturing. Some of it is scaffolding. That when the chromosome folds up, those pieces of DNA in there hold genes in, well, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the third dimension. So that's the first dimension, the line. The second dimension is the way all of the genes interact with each other. In most biology classes, we learn about the lac operon of E. coli. That's lac for lactose. <laughs> 
It's the ability of E. coli to digest that sugar lactose or not. And it depends upon the presence of glucose, the presence of lactose, the presence of a cat protein and RNA polymerase or a presser protein. There's all these different things. And when everything is right, in other words, when there's lactose present and no glucose present, this system will be turned on and these three genes in a row, boom, 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 will be transcribed and made into a different enzyme, three different enzymes that digest lactose. They're not, these three genes here are next to each other in the E. coli genome, that's true, but these other ones aren't. If you wanted to do a map, you'd have to write out the E. coli genome and draw arrows between all the different places that interact in two dimensions. So the second dimension of the genome is a two-dimensional interaction network. But if you really wanted to map it, you wouldn't be able to see those yellow lines. You'd see nothing but red because there'd be so many thousands of arrows on the screen connecting everything it interacts with in the cell because that cell is incredibly tightly and dynamically regulated. And we can draw beautiful pictures like this, this is the, um, the microRNA regulation network that influences um, hardening of the arteries. But all of these proteins, these little microRNA things, they control these protein genes, but these aren't in the 2%. This is the so-called junk DNA. Junk DNA has an eloquent, eloquent and exquisite dance of molecules. Yeah. The junk DNA regulates the proteins. No, it's like this. You are not a protein computer. You're an RNA computer. Your body makes a massive amount of RNA. The RNA, it's like if it was a computer, the, the DNA would be the read-only memory, the ROM. The RNA would be the RAM, the random access memory where all the decisions were made. And the proteins would be the output. You're an RNA computer. Almost everything your cell does is producing RNA and it produces a little bit of protein at the end. But that RNA is encoded in the coding portion. It's in the so-called junk DNA, which we can't even call junk DNA anymore because it's so important. We're talking about specificity factors, enhancers, repressors, activators, transcription factors, post-transcriptional regulation systems, alternate splicing. It's crazy complicated. I'm sorry, you want to take a picture there? I'll hold that up first, just a second. There you go. Something happened um, back in 2003. It's called the ENCODE project. They wanted to know how much of the genome was functional. So what they did is they looked at 1% of the genome only, but 1% scattered in little pieces all over the genome. They said, how much of this has turned into RNA? You're like, almost all of it. And not only that, they realized that the RNAs overlap each other in the genome. So there's like an RNA here and here and here and here and the different start and stop points. So any given letter, any random letter in the genome on average is incorporated to six different RNA messages. So if you mutate that one letter right there, maybe change that A to a G, you just affected a lot of things. You might affect your ability to see in the dark, how well you digest garlic, how tall you are, and the shape of your nose. <laughs> is literally random things are coded on top of each other in the genome. Whoa, interleaved information? It would be like, I hand you a chocolate chip cookie recipe and I make a misspelling and now it's a recipe for rocket fuel. <laughs> <laughs> but there's six different messages coded into that one piece of paper. That's not something evolution would produce. Natural selection needs to operate on a very clear target. That is not a clear target. It's called pleiotropy. Most genes, changes to one gene affect more than one thing. Like, yeah, sure, the, my MCR1 gene gives me the skin color. Okay, fine. But it also affects the uh, acid production in my stomach. Oh. Most every variant has more than one effect. And that makes it really hard for natural selection to deal with. Here I'm showing you a diagram of a typical gene. DNA is double-stranded, so there's two strands there. Usually, 
If one strand is coding for a protein, the other strand isn't. But sometimes there are proteins nested within other proteins, and sometimes you can have two proteins that overlap and read in different directions at the same time. But most genes are like this. You have an upstream area that doesn't turn into protein. It's called an untranslated region. This is where the control of the gene is. This is where enhancers and repressors and things like that stick onto the DNA. And then you have red, these red things are called exons and the blue things are called introns. Introns are intervening spaces. They don't get turned into protein, They're only the red things do. So your cell will go through, it'll land a polymerase on the yellow, the yellow area, it will slide down the DNA, making RNA, and then it has to cut out the introns and splice the exons together. That's a complicated process, meaning the target for mutation is very large. When you have something complex and you change it, you can have catastrophic effects. It's a very complicated system, but here's a mystery. We know the human body produces something like 300,000 different proteins. Different cell types produce different proteins. Your eyeballs don't produce the same proteins as your liver. Therefore, most geneticists before the human genome was, was co uh, decoded said we should have at least tens of thousands, I'm sorry, at least hundreds of thousands of proteins. We have about 23,000. How does 23,000 protein coding genes produce hundreds of thousands of proteins? Well, the answer is splicing and dicing. Those red exons are used in different proteins under different conditions at different times. And there's a code in, at the, the junction between the introns and the exons. There's 12 to 19 little short five, six letter um, codes that say, Oh, use this exon in an eyeball under low oxygen. Oh, but use this one, the same exon in your liver when you're trying to digest garlic. Or, I'm sorry, that's not supposed to be. Life is supposed to be simple. And the discovery of the splicing code was crazy. Okay, you know what three dimensions are, right? Something has a shape, length, width, and height. Well, your genome has three dimensions. Here's a linear chromosome, has a telomere at the end, both ends. There's a short arm, a long arm, and the centromere. That is the, the centromere, the telomere is just highly repetitive DNA. Your genes are in, in the short and long arms of your chromosomes. That's in one dimension. We have to pack that into a cell. So here we have, I expanded the nucleus, the yellow circles, the nucleus of cell. I put a genome in there, but that's not how your chromosomes look. That's only when they condense before your cell divides in half. Usually they're spread out and the centromeres are clustered in the thing called the, the centriolus and the telomeres are anchored to the nuclear wall. Oh, they actually have an arrangement in space, but it's not like this. If you take the DNA and fold it up 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 and compact it down and then put it into this, whoa, wait a minute. The genome has a shape. The chromosomes have a shape. And the shape of the chromosomes dictates which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. Genes that are buried don't get expressed. So when God wrote that one dimensional <laughs> genome, including all that so called junk DNA, he knew when he let go how it would fold. And he positioned things here, here, or there based on his knowledge of how it was going to fold. Or else the genome would not work because you can't do something like that randomly. It's intelligent engineering. I remember uh, after the human genome was decoded, one of the first papers I read, some scientists went through and they said, okay, we have this example of a whack operon. We get a bunch of a cluster of genes that are used together or right next to each other in the bacterial genome. Well, we have all these biochemical pathways in people. We hypothesize that genes that are used in biochemical pathways will be clustered together. And they weren't. So they said, oh, it's just a bunch of junk. Millions of years of evolutionary experiments, random changes, 
The genes are just thrown there and they're willy nilly. There's no design, there's no forethought. It's just random. Until someone realized the three dimensional shape of the chromosomes, genes that are used together are found next to each other, not on the chromosomes, in 3D space. And they tend to be clustered around a core or a, an open spot in the genome, which is right next to a nuclear pore. So when your genome or when your cell needs to turn on a group of genes, it turns them all on at the same time. And the messenger RNAs go right out the nuclear pore together and they can be dealt with together and regulated simultaneously. Now we learn that the little machines that, that convert the RNA into protein, we knew we had different versions of them, but now we realize that the different versions are tuned to work best with different groups of proteins. So one cluster of genes would use that type of ribosome, another cluster of genes would use another type of ribosome. It's just another example of fine tuning. Fine tuning is amazing. Okay, you're, you're right so far? Ready for fourth dimension? What's the fourth dimension? Time. The genome changes. The DNA sequence, that's the first dimension. The interaction networks, that's the second dimension, and the 3D shape over time. As you're developing in your mother's womb, there are certain genes that are needed early in development that are never needed again. So your chromosomes will refold for the next stage of development. When you hit puberty, there are genes that, are, that they kick in for the first time ever. Your chromosomes are reshaped. When you eat something toxic, your liver will say, hey, uh, I got a gene for that. I can detoxify that. Your eyeballs are like, I don't know what to do. So only your liver cells will change shape. The genome will change shape to produce a protein to detoxify that. Whoa, this happens over minutes. The rearrangements, duplications, deletions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is um, something amazing. Um, I'm 53 years old now. I weigh more now than I've ever weighed in my life. Most of you can probably identify with that. But all my life, I was a stick. And I was, I was, I mean, as skinny as anyone could ever be. Just, just the way I was built. But now that I'm getting older, things are changing quick. <laughs> um, my eyesight, my hearing's going. My, all my joints ache. We've got a lot of inflammation. I keep telling myself, stop eating beef, but I, I just love cow. I can't stop eating it. So <laughs> this, um, this diagram was produced by a guy named Ornish. Now he's a gadfly. Most scientists don't like this guy, but he did this study on men. He had uh, men with a large prostate. So they didn't have prostate cancer yet. So he could do an experiment on them. And the experiment was this, come back in six months. He gave half of the guys a general guide to diet and exercise, and the other half, he just said, come back. And they did a biopsy before and after. This is the experimental group, not the control group. We have before on the left and after on the right. Up on top are um, stress genes. Green is on, red is off. Underneath this line are general housekeeping genes. Red is off, green is on. For the men who just ate, he didn't even give them, it wasn't like the Southeast diet, he just gave them general diet guidelines and general exercise guidelines. And their genomes changed. The genes that were being expressed, I mean, hundreds of genes here, radically changed. Now they're still on. You see maybe some guys didn't do as well with their plan as others maybe, but the genes are still on, they're just reduced in frequency. The stress genes went down. We know what controls lifespan. One is genetics. There are certain genetic factors that if you carry those factors, you will probably live to 100 years old, even though you might have the heart disease gene that kills your neighbor at age 50. We know those genes exist. We found them and we could take a mouse and genetically change one letter in the mouse and we'll live twice as long. Because our genomes pre-program when it's time to die. There's nothing we can do to escape that bar genetic engineering. However, 
diet and exercise and mental state and emotional state have a huge impact on our lifespan, our mental faculties, the strength of our heart, the strength of our muscles. Uh, when we stop moving, we die quickly. So we need to keep moving. That is one of the, actually the, one of the greatest things to keep someone healthy and mentally sharp is light exercise. The diet, the, the science is right there. Sorry, I'm getting off my hobby horse here. <laughs> but more changes over time. Your liver needs to do a lot of work in, in detoxifying and, and um, it does a lot of processing of, of biological molecules. And one way to do that is it needs more copies of those molecules. So it just duplicates the chromosomes. Your liver cells have more chromosomes than the rest of your body cells. And different liver cells have different copies of different chromosomes. Huh. Your brain cells have different genomes. When your brain is developing, see if I was gonna invent a brain, I would have it like go grow this way first and then get thick. That's not the way that God designed the, the brain. Your brain cells, they, they're produced in certain brain cell producing regions, and then they migrate through the growing brain to get to where they're going. But as they're being produced, these little things called retrotransposons or jumping genes, they jump around in the brain genome and turn certain genes on and certain genes off. We tried dynamic programming in computers back in the 70s, and everyone just got rid of it because you couldn't predict the results. They're trying it again now, but it is one of the most notoriously difficult things in computers. Oh, we can make the computer program a lot smaller if we can reprogram it on the fly. <laughs> yeah, any computer programmers out there? You know how hard that would be? Okay, your brain does it automatically. We also learned that some of these jumping genes uh, control embryonic development because a lot of the retrotransposons have gene promoters in them. So if they're in a place next to a gene, they turn the gene on. If they move, the gene's off. And there's one particular one that controls embryonic development in a mouse. If you get rid of that, what we thought was junk DNA, the mouse embryo will grow and it's stop and it won't go any further. <laughs> there's another so-called piece of junk DNA that controls the attachment of the um, of the, um, the placenta to the uterine wall. Without that, you can't have mammals. All right, let's go through a process here. Make sure my sound is off. Go. Hmm. Turn off my pointer. Click. There we go. That is a nucleotide, one of the four bases in DNA. There is a DNA strand, which is about to come into focus, two meters in each cell. Let's turn this into a protein, shall we? Just watch what happens here. Oh, that thing is just zip by. That's a DNA polymerase or an RNA polymerase. It's actually making a copy of one strand of the DNA by sucking in nucleotides on one side, matching them up. So A, C's, T, G's, and T's match the A, C's, G's, and U's. And that red line there is called an RNA. A messenger RNA. Now we are way oversimplifying this. There's so many things involved in this. We just want to make it simple. Now we have an RNA. We're not going to splice out the introns and, and we're not going to do all that kind of stuff. We're just going to go straight from here to protein. Watch what happens. These little things are called transfer RNAs. At the bottom, they have a three letter code. The three letter code matches the three letters in the RNA. They go into this thing called a ribosome. This is literally how it works. It takes in the, mess, the transfer RNAs from one side, matches them up, and then kicks out the transfer RNA. But on top of the transfer RNA, they've been loaded with an amino acid. Each one is a different amino acid. There's 20 amino acids. But that red thing now there, that is a protein, but most proteins will turn into a bird's nest. They need help being folded. So these other proteins called chaperones glom onto the unfolded protein and prevent it from folding. They escort it to another molecule called a chaperonin. We don't know how it works on the inside. We know how it's shaped. It's shaped kind of like a watermelon. So we made a watermelon colored. <laughs> the unfolded protein goes in one end. 
and then it works some sort of magic. And if the protein doesn't fold correctly, this will chop it up and recycle the parts. But if it does fold correctly, it'll spit out a folded protein. That is a three-dimensional machine that works by changing shape in four dimensions with a 20-letter alphabet. We started with a linear four-letter alphabet and ended up with a four-dimensional 20-letter alphabet. The thing is, there is no relationship between the function of that protein and the chemistry of A, C, G, and T. There's a huge layer of abstraction here. We just went through multiple different languages, converting from one language to another into a radically different language. It's not like French to German. It's like the most complicated language in the world from the most simplest language in the world. But it's not even like that. It, it's something other. It's something we can't even describe with human phraseology because it's just bizarre. And that happens in all of you constantly. Speaking of junk DNA, this theory came about to solve a theoretical problem that was uh, postulated in the 1950s, something called Hal Haldane's Dilemma. Haldane's famous uh, evolutionary geneticist guy, and he said, you know what? Natural selection can only work on a few things at a time. And even given the vast time between humans and chimpanzees, which back then you might've thought is 2 million years, today they say 6.5 million years, doesn't matter, it's a long time. Maybe, you know, only a few hundred mutations could be fixed in the human genome fixes and made stuck to make us different than chimpanzees. So in the late 1960s and early 70s, Japanese scientists Kamura and Ono, they developed what's called junk DNA theory. Yeah, okay, so natural selection can only do a few things, but 98% of the genome doesn't code for protein. That can just mutate randomly. That's where junk DNA came from. And as everything I just showed you, I hope you can see it's not true. Uh, J.S. Maddock is a geneticist. Uh, he, quoted, he was quoted as saying this. Um, the phrase intervening non-coding sequences, you can replace that with junk DNA if you want. The failure to recognize the full implication of this, particularly the possibility that the junk DNA, the intervening non-coding sequences, may be transmitting parallel information in the form of RNA molecules, may well go down as one of the biggest mistakes in the history of molecular biology. Now it was 20 years ago we said that. And our understanding of the system has only radically gone up. So, summarize. I conclude the genome is a multi dimensional operating system for an ultra complex biological computer. It has built in error correcting self modification codes, which I didn't talk about. We have examples of multiple overlapping DNA codes and RNA codes and structural codes. There are DNA genes, there are RNA genes. It was designed with a large amount of redundancy. You have two copies of your genome. When they used to launch a space shuttle for every critical component, there were three of them. So if something failed, they had a backup to the backup. If they could. Now, a couple of times, space shuttles had big problems and blew up and burned up because what critical component failed that they couldn't duplicate. But anything they could duplicate, they did. The genome has lots of duplication because it was designed by a sound, a good engineer using sound engineering principles. But despite all that redundancy, it also displays an amazing degree of compactness because only 20,000 or so protein coding genes make about 300,000 or so distinct proteins. So I have a challenge to the evolutionists. It's very simple. Explain the origin of the genome. I will give you millions of years. I'll give you a warm little pond. I'll give you nucleotides. I'll give you cells. I'll give you DNA. You still can't explain the origin of the genome because the genome is a computer operating system. Random letters don't make computer operating systems. Ever. Go ahead, go on your hard drive and start changing ones to zeros and see what happens. Randomness is the antithesis a complexity. Now I'm going to read a quote from Charles Darwin. I know this has been abused many times, and I know he didn't think this was true, but he said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organism, organ existed 
which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Why well, claim the genome could not have arisen through known naturalistic processes? So I'll, I'll, I just want the evolution to give me a workable scenario that includes the source of informational changes, the count of the mutation necessary, the number of mutations, the strength of the mutation, how much natural selection you need to remove them. And I'll even give them millions of years. And I don't believe they can do it. And that is my summary of the four dimensional genome. If you want more information, I have a DVD on the tables called the High Tech Cell. That was essentially this talk. There's information on creation.com. Uh, the multi dimensional genome is an article that I wrote based on this, which is really long. If you want more, it's a newer article, so there's even more information on it. We have tons of material there for you. If you want a place to start, just like last night, and I'll do it again tomorrow night. If you want a place to start, take a look at Creation Magazine. I just had an article come out in Creation Magazine, I had one magazine before that. We're constantly writing brand new information. It's on the cutting edge of the creation movement. It's um, satisfying, it's soul enriching. We learn about God, we learn about the Bible, we learn about science. It's a great family magazine. In fact, I still read it even though it's a family magazine because me, the nerd, I still learn things in it. So it's there for us and it's, it's I, I love Creation Magazine, just saying. We have an option of getting it for one year or two year. For one year subscription, you'll start with the magazine, it's on the table out there and you walk home with it. But for a two year subscription, we'll give you a copy of the magazine. We'll sign you up for our digital version of our magazine, which we'll let you share with anybody you want. And you can read it on any device you want. I've tried to read it on my phone, it's a little small, but I've read it on my laptop and on my Kindle and you can share it with other people. That's what we want you to do. We'll also throw in, two different DVDs. We'll throw in Darwin, the Voyage that Shook the World. This is a million dollar production. That's, this is CMI's first movie that we ever made. We did a movie uh, or documentary on the life of Charles Darwin in honor of his 200th birthday. If you want to understand evolution, you've got to understand that man. He's not the man most people think. Do you know he was housebound from the age of 29 till the day he died? He was agoraphobic. He's afraid of outside. He was afraid of crowds. He wouldn't talk to strangers. What an odd bird. Anyway, <laughs> um, we're also going to include a 35 minute mini documentary made called Fallout, where we took a TV camera around to college campuses and we asked students questions. Were you raised in church? Were you ever taught anything about creation and evolution? Do you still go to church? Simple questions like that. And man, they said the most incredible things. Captured on film, edited it, put it into this little documentary. There's some powerful stuff in that. You can get that with a two year magazine. I think they, what's that thing I popped up? One year subscription is $29, two year subscription is $50. The forms are right out there on the table. Please take advantage of it. I know I hate marketing people, I'm not trying to do that, but you know, I got, I got to pay for my flight home. So <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Um, here's another DVD, Mitochondrial Leaving the Three Daughters of Noah. It's my first genetics talk I ever gave in public. It was in front of 700 people in Australia at one of our super conferences. I'm claiming in this talk that we've discovered Adam and Eve, Noah's Flood, and the Tower of Babel, and it's in the human genome. The evolutionists discovered it. Yeah. Right there. This is the high tech cell, so I get a picture of it. Here's another one Evolution's Achilles Heels. The book and the documentary, this is the most hard hitting information that we could produce. We, at, we interviewed no one but PhD scientists who believe the Bible. We said, okay, Mr. Scientist, in your area of expertise, what can evolution not answer? And man, they said the most incredible things. Those are out there on the tables for you also. Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome by my dear friend, John Sanford. Powerful information from a former evolutionist, former atheist who came into church and then came to creation and then he wrote an insider's guide to evolutionary theory. Very, very interesting book. And it has a different cover than this one, so we're still. I'm gonna leave you with 1 Peter 3.15. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. 
always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. You do it with gentleness and respect. The last part's the hardest part. I'm a jerk. <laughs> I cut people off. I get angry. I think we probably all do that too, right? To some degree. But we're called to answer and to answer the best way we can. See, I think that we can stand on scripture confidently and competently without having to yell at people. And very often a gentle answer has turned away wrath. But I understand that we're not experts in genetics and evolution and things like that. Some of you nerdy people out here might be, but most of you probably aren't. So here's a great, a great, my final little bit of advice. You're talking to somebody and they're saying a bunch of stuff and you have no idea what they're talking about. It happens, right? Happens to me. So what we say, you say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Might as well admit it, but I think I know where there's an answer. I'm gonna go to creation.com. I'm gonna come back tomorrow and we're gonna keep on talking. You know what, it's a fine answer? Because you're not lying and they don't expect you to come back. And when you do come back, and here's my answer. And they hit you with something else. Actually, what I found out, another little bit of advice, um, they play tennis. When you're about to score a point, they change the direction of the ball. And, and oh, okay, and oh, okay. And they, they make you jump around. So here's what I've done, and this works great. Hold on a second, ma'am, sir, whoever you're talking to. Um, you just change the subject. Do you acknowledge that I just scored a point? <laughs> <laughs> they do not like that. But by doing that, you can corral the, the discussion. Say, look, I will answer that second question too, but let's answer this one first. Do you acknowledge that I had a valid point to make? And all of a sudden, you're not just some stark raving maniac. You're actually someone who actually knows something. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the cell, for technology, so we can understand it, for DNA, for the genome. We're, we're shocked. We're standing back in awe saying, what have you made? It's so far beyond our reckoning. We, we just don't get it. But that only brings glory to you. Lord, help us to keep that in mind. Help us to understand that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Help us to praise you for it. And even more, Lord, help us to share this knowledge with other people. There are a lot of people who would like to hear what we just learned tonight. Amen. Are we going to do a question and answer period? Yes. Okay, my favorite time. I will announce that. So. Okay, so now we're going to uh, do a, a, a question and answer. Um, and if you have a question, raise your hand and um, I will try to find you and I will bring the mic to you. So think fast, get your questions done fast so we can do it before this mic dies. <laughs> Let me put some rules on the Q&A. Yes. Um, as a guest of this church, I do not want to be tempted to contradict something this church might teach. Um, I probably agree with most of it, but I don't know. So let's avoid doctrinal questions that have nothing to do with science or Genesis. Some doctrinal questions about Genesis are tricky, and I'll try to answer them, but you know, Bible translations, free will versus predestination, modes of baptism, no. Those are for a different time. And please try to keep your questions short and end it with a question mark. And I'll try to keep my answer short. i will be hard. But I'm going to try to give you a brief answer and then point you to some place that will answer more fully. Okay. 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 And one other thing I just wanted to point out is while we're doing question and answers, we're probably going to send turn send the um, offering baskets around. So just so you'll know, if you an offering that goes in there goes into the Rocky Mountain Creation Fellowship Treasury and helps us to bring in speakers like like Dr. Carter here, uh, and that that's where your contribution is going, and we very much appreciate that. Okay, so well, my colleague Jonathan Sarford, he does a Q and A. He has a usually he has a, a copy of the Creation Answers book in his hands, and someone asks a question, and he'll say, "Oh yes, uh, chapter five. Next question, <laughs> <laughs> sir." Okay, I have a question. 
I have a relative that has really done <clears throat> kind of bunkers on vaccination. Oh, and no questions about COVID-19. I forgot <laughs> about that. Okay, I, I should have said that. Go ahead and ask. I might not answer it. Does the, um, does the vaccine have any potential of changing your DNA? Great question. It's a fair question. It's a DNA question, so we can do that. Um, I will refer you to creation.com. Type in COVID-19, my article. Type in vaccines, Jonathan Sarfati's article. We deal with this as carefully as we can. Um, of course, yes, there is a vanishingly small uh, percent chance that RNA or DNA injected into one of your cells can change your genome. But if that is true, don't get infected by the virus because those little viral particles, I mean, each cell is producing like a thousand viral particles before it bursts. It floods your entire body, not just one little spot. So, and, and there are some viruses that do change our DNA. There are some viruses that actually nest into our DNA on purpose, like HIV. It intercalates, it sticks itself into our genome, which is why it's almost impossible to get rid of it because it can pop out again and make new viral particles later. So some viruses do that, but there is no good evidence that the, this particular vaccine has done it or will do it. And yet, if it's possible, then the virus is incredibly dangerous. Just saying. Okay? Let's not do any more COVID-19 questions. That just can make everybody angry. I don't fly home with mask on. It makes me mad, so I don't want to get mad. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. So, Dr. Carter, uh, the slide that you had the four different uh, letters that were converted to colors, I didn't, I didn't understand the part that was gray. Uh, you could reiterate what was going on. The gray on. part was a part that we were not able to sequence. Oh, the so it's not been sequenced. No, yeah. okay. Last week it was. They just announced the telomere to telomere project has finally finished 20 years after the human genome. We went through the telomeres, the centromeres, and the gaps. The reason there's a gap there is that the sequencing machines that they were using back then, they had only sequenced about 300 letters and another 300 letters in different parts. And they make millions of these little 300 letter things and then use a computer to line them up. But if you had something that's very repetitious, where do you stick that 300 letter block? You, you don't know. So what they did is they added about 300 places in the genome with 10,000 letter ends. So instead of A, T, G, and C, it was just N or 5,000. They tried to guess how, how big that space was and they made a nice round number and they stick that number of letters in there. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Same thing happens when you're listening to a song, like you get in a car and the radio turns on, you, you hum the song or something, and openly you miss up because you're in the wrong verse. Because you don't know when the song turns on where you are in a song, because our songs have lots of repetition. Same thing here. Lots of repetition. They just didn't know where to put the pieces. Hi, I have a two or three part question, but they're okay. small parts. So would you agree that a radioisotope dating is the primary way we determine the age of the Earth? Uh, I just so happened to have written a very long article on carbon dating, uh, which is being edited right now. It's actually on creation.com. You can find it if you search for it. It just hasn't gone on the front page yet. Uh, wow. Uh, so, uh, is radiometric dating the primary way of determining the age of the Earth? No. And I'm not asking about it, carbon because that's oh, a shorter time. That's period. right. Uh, no, it's not. Okay. The age of the Earth was determined before radiometric dating was invented. There weren't any practical radiometric dating techniques until after World War II. They tried in the 1800s, but I mean, what they tried was, was pretty ridiculous. Um, now we have we have been able to confirm that some things are older than others, but the whole question is, is half-life and is it stable? We know there's, there are multiple radioactive elements whose half-lives can be varied with magnetic fields, high temperature, and things like that. My, my question so, was a pretty okay. question. I wasn't trying to, okay. so that was my, my point. I think in most modern um, textbooks, we use radioisotope dating to date the age of the Earth. Exactly. Yes, but we only use specific tests because the other tests, they don't want to use those tests. So yes, okay. right. Okay. okay, fair enough, go okay. ahead. But there's a couple of assumptions that have to be made to believe radioisotope dating. Yes. And those assumptions seem very flimsy. 
those assumptions are squarely based upon uniformitarian naturalism, which are the underlying philosophies that undergird the entire modern scientific world. Right, Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell, yeah, right. and, and um, others. But those assumptions seem so flimsy, but why do they escape the questioning of reasonably smart scientists? Because they ring their bell. Okay. It's because they assume naturalism, uniformitarianism, slow and gradual. It's funny because the Christian, we have a reason for believing why the universe is stable. It's because our brilliant creator God is a God of law. And he would naturally have made a universe that operates according to law because he doesn't do anything against his own nature. The reason the universe behaves like it does is because of God. The uh, alternative, basically in the 1700s, the philosophers, not the scientists, but the philosophers stole the idea that's universal scientific law and got rid of God. So there's law. That's a big assumption, but they start there. And once you have that and get rid of God, now all they allow in sciences is using law, or using science. They will only allow naturalistic observations to explain everything. Well, I think it's a worldview issue that gets absolutely away from the issue. science yeah. issue. Yeah, no, absolutely. In fact, uh, one of my favorite fun talks that I do is um, a biblical worldview. And it's all philosophy. How do you know what you know? How do you really know that? How do you know I'm not a robot? How do you know you're awake right now? And it goes on from there. And that I'm trying to get people to get rid of this naturalism that's in their brain and to understand it's an assumption. And yet naturalism doesn't explain the genome. Naturalism doesn't explain radiometric dating as well as they thought. And it's getting worse, but that's still something that's a, a, a tremendous nut to still crack. We don't have the specific answer to address it. But carbon dating, we do. Carbon dating is our best friend. Thank you, Mr. Evolutionist, for inventing that. You can go play with something else now. <laughs> we own carbon dating. I mean, you, you would agree carbon dating is pretty reliably accurate. It's the carbon dating is extremely accurate for the past 2,000 years. <laughs> when you start getting into um, Jericho, like, you know, Kathleen Kenyon, she dug in Jericho in the 1950s, less than 10 years after carbon dating was invented, and said, I see no evidence for the destruction of Joshua. And yet Garstang in the 30s dug there, and he said, this is the biblical story. Two walls, one wall fell outward, leaving a ramp for them to go up. There's one place a wall didn't fall. That would have been Rahab's house. The city was deliberately burned. Nothing was taken out of the city. No one lived there for another 500 years. I mean, that's the biblical story. But Kenyon, using carbon dating, her date was 120 years earlier than the Bible's timing for the destruction of Joshua. And that was the rejection of the biblical story, that one little datum. Um, if you look, I just learned this recently, in Beersheba, where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived, and Isaac planted and reaped a hundredfold, there was intensive agriculture in Beersheba, which is now a desert. And when you look at the archaeology, the last agriculture there was in the Chalcolithic. That's the Copper Age. They date that 6,000 years ago. Uh, I'm sorry, that must have been Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's time frame. The carbon dates are 6,000 years ago. The biblical dates are 4,000 and less years ago. What we're seeing is Jericho is 100-something years too much. The Chalcolithic is 400 years too much, and it just amplifies. So you look at um, dinosaur bones. Dinosaur bones routinely carbon date to about 30,000 years ago. They were alive the day before Noah's flood. That's the antediluvian carbon-14 level. We see it in dinosaur bones less 4,500 years, which is nearly one half-life. So double it, and that's about how much carbon-14 was in the atmosphere prior to the flood, et cetera. Oh, boy, carbon-14s. Is that, was that yeah. all three parts? Yeah, yeah, I think. Okay. Great question. So just to be clear, when you're talking about the four dimensions, those are the typical four dimensions you'd run across in math and physics and such like that? Yes and no. The first, third, and fourth are. The second dimension is interaction network in two dimensions. OK. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. So 
So we read the um, the book Refuting Evolution when it first came, okay. and um, I've I've just been wondering about the what's going on with the uh, scientific community and their agreement with I believe it was Richard Dawkins who said um, there's no design observed in nature. Is that true? Uh, yeah, what he, he said, wrote the blind watching. Would Dawkins say that universe is complex system with the something of design looks like it was designed but wasn't what he said something like that yeah. okay anyway um, he he yeah he, he you know my art we have two sons raised in christian family who are um they've turned away from their faith and they it's I'm about sorry. the science you now right so my question as a mom is um really no design observed in nature so if you look at the metamorphosis of a butterfly or if you look at what you talk about with um, dna molecules and um you know the storage capacity capability of a cell and all that and you look at the way a baby goes from a liquid <coughs> that was developed in the mother's womb a, a you know liquid and then suddenly they can breathe air what what how how is the how do you talk to a really smart college graduate um well someone talked to me as a really smart college person i've mean, always been super nerdy scientists like i've always been you know one of the smartest people around i'm not bragging i'm saying that's true right and so i was really arrogant and i thought i knew everything and i was talking to this homeschool mom and i was only over there her daughter was in high school and she was in college now but she invited me over to her house and i had a crush on this girl and her mom was like hey who's this boy that you just brought home and so she started talking about stuff and um that's the first time in my life i ever met anyone actually believe the bible and i thought she was crazy and i said oh come on evolution's a fact i said and she said oh i said yeah and she said well what about this and this and this and this and i answered that and that and that and, that. and then she said what about um and i said and pachycetus a perfect transitional form between uh, walking animals and whales and she goes don't you know they just discovered the rest of the skeleton? What? She goes, yeah, it has legs. What? Because the pictures I had in my mind, it had flippers. And so she took my abuse and I look thinking back, um, yeah, there's a reason why I never dated that girl. Um, <laughs> but her defense, even though it wasn't much of a defense, she stood there and took it politely and very patiently, shockingly patiently, and finally gave me one, because I was, I was throwing everything I could at her because I did not want to hear what she was saying, even though I thought I was a Christian at the time. I don't think I was yet a Christian, but I'd gone to church all my life. I didn't know anything about the Bible. Um, and I was just a little punk. And honestly, if that wasn't the Holy Spirit just knocking a hole in my heart, I don't know what it was. And so it's a, like, we can't change people. It drives me away. It's not possible. We can only faithfully follow what God's told us to do. Like the first Peter 3.15 thing there. It's not up to us to make them decide our point. It's up to them. And what I found is that the tennis thing I talked about earlier is people do not want to engage these questions and they will do everything they can to change the subject. And if you start winning, only they get mad because they don't want to hear it. You know, just like, I mean, in the Bible, they stop their ears, <laughs> try to kill them. What? Um, yeah, people can only push so far. And when you start challenging their existence, just saying, I, I don't have an answer. Honestly, there is no answer. Except what? Except to not give up. Except do not give up. Um, do you know why so many Catholics are named Monica? Monica is Augustine's mother's name. She prayed for her carousing, drunkard, womanizing, wicked son for 30 years. He finally gets converted, and he wrote more books than probably any Christians ever. I don't think anyone's ever read all, all, all of Augustine's works. The guy almost wrote a library. He's crazy productive. And he was as wicked as he could be. So, yeah, don't give up. All right.
We're just here to write out our testimony or give our testimony. It's our testimony. Nobody can argue with it. And just point them what to what God has done for you. And he'll do it for them if they'll give themselves to him. Excellent point. Um, on the video, you had the animation of the, I'm going to pronounce it polymerase, you pronounced it differently, P-O-L-Y-M-E-R-A-S-E, polymerase, yes. As it's going down the DNA chain, my understanding is that as the, the DNA uh, helix enters the poly polymerase, it unwinds, things happen, comes out the other end, it's rewound. Oh no, yeah. topor isomerase helps, helicase helps. Um, there are lots of proteins involved in that because if you just, if you take a string and just do that to it, like a, you, it'll get knotted. And so the DNA has to con constantly get unknotted and other enzymes do that at the same time. Okay. Okay. Um, my question is, it, it, at least it looked to me like the protein molecule was being formed using half of the DNA helix. Yes. And my question is, what does the other half of that helix do after it's done? Excellent. This is called the coding strand and the non-coding strand. The coding strand codes for a gene, if you would, but the non-coding strand can also code for a gene. They, they, can, be, they can be like that. Sometimes they can overlap. Sometimes one gene can be nestled into an intron that's going to be cut and thrown away. There's a gene in there. So it, it's, it's all that information that's compacted down. E. coli doesn't have much of that. Bacteria have very simple genomes. They're very linear. And they're very, this piece, this piece, this piece, this piece. But humans and other complex organisms, our genomes are scrambled up and, and written on top of itself in complicated ways. Dr. Carter, Sir. so um, when they first started mapping the human genome, like just the very first tiny part, they did a comparison said that chimp DNA was like 99 point something. They did. Similar to humans. But now that the whole human genome is mapped, um, what's the story? The first chimpanzee genome, which came out just a couple of years after the human genome, was a debacle of science, a complete and total embarrassment. Hmm. They cheaped out. They didn't want to spend $3 billion. So to get, to get enough of those 300 base pair things to overlap to make a whole genome, you have to sequence the genome about 30 times over. So at random, you have enough pieces at random to fill in all the gaps. They sequenced the chimp genome about five or six times over and use the human genome as a scaffold to build the chimpanzee genome. They assumed common ancestry without ever testing it. And that, like the first human genome has 300 something gaps of you know 10, 20, 30,000 letters long. The first chimpanzee genome had 300,000 gaps, five, six, seven letters long, because the pieces didn't overlap and they didn't know what to do. And so, and then no one did any work on the chimpanzee genome for about 10 years. Literally, they just, it just sat there. And I predicted, I said, yep, they're waiting until enough time goes by that they won't have egg on their face if they redo it. And they told all their graduate students, no, 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 don't, you're not working your PhD on that. That's no, you're going to do something else. And then just the first thing they redid was the chimpanzee Y chromosome. And that's when we learned that the chimpanzee Y chromosome is radically different than the human Y chromosome. The Neanderthal Y chromosome they thought was radically different. And just last year, they finally redid it to a high quality. They said, oh, it's not different at all. It's fully human, Y chromosome. All the parts are right there. It's not different. Letters different, but structurally it's the same thing. Chimpanzee thing, it's just all randomly different. Um, and now we've got multiple high quality genomes of chimpanzee. And it, there are like 30 to 50 single letter differences between our two species. That's a lot. 
that has to happen in only 6 million years. That's only like 200,000 generations. That means that every generation, what's, what's 30 million divided by 200,000? 200, 2 million. So let's say every generation, a thousand letters have to become fixed in our population. That means every single person now has a different letter in their genome than their ancestors had. So even like, let, let's imagine that like I have the Adonis gene. I can imagine that. And I'm just so good looking and all the girls love me. And because of that, this mutation that caused me to be so good looking, so handsome that um, I have lots and lots of children. And all my children are good looking also. And that gene starts spreading through the human population. How long would it take for that gene to spread out throughout the entire population? I don't know, 100,000 years, 10,000 years, a long time. And that's a gene with a high selective advantage because you have it, man, you have lots of kids. Most genes aren't like that at all. Most genetic changes do nothing. Selection can ignore them. And we have to fix a thousand of those per generation. The math is not there. So honestly, God could have taken a chimpanzee genome and changed one letter called a human. But he didn't. He did make us very similar to chimpanzees, that is true, but if we're different enough, we can't explain an evolutionary history. Now, to your question, I'm sorry, I'm rambling here. Different people say there are different levels of, of similarity between humans and chimpanzees. I don't know what the number is because it depends on what you're comparing. If you compare only the protein coding regions, like 96 or 97 percent identical. Okay, that's protein coding regions only. That's not the splicing code. That's not all the junk DNA and all the regulation that happens in the RNA. That is different. The main difference between us and chimps is not the genes we carry, it's how we regulate those genes. Genetic regulation is a difference between us and them. Whoa. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to put a number on that. If you take random pieces of human DNA and throw it at the chimpanzee genome, about 80% of them will stick. If you take random pieces of chimpanzee genome, I'm talking you know, 30, 50 letters, and throw it to the human genome, about 80% of them will stick. In other words, about 20% of our DNA has no comparison. I don't care how similar we are. If we're less than 98% similar, evolution dies. We're probably about 90% similar. Okay, I'm fine with that. As long as it's below the evolutionary cutoff, whatever, <laughs> whatever number I'm happy with. I just don't know exactly what that number is. Okay, thank you. Cool question. I promise we're not gonna go on forever. I see some people yawning. <laughs> yeah, well, it's my bedtime right now. It's 10.32 on my clock. I was asleep two nights ago at this time. So here I am, happy and perky just for you. So <laughs> well, this is kind of a technical question. And I don't know if I'm phrasing this right. Okay. But I understand like in a proton, like there's two up quarks and one down, or in yes. a ne neutron, there's two down quarks and one up. Something like that. Okay, and I understand that on the quantum level, there's like a slurry of quarks and electrons kind of wave and all that. So when we get uh, those in our cell, does that cell keep the same quarks or does it process through and have different ones. Uh, free quarks in a nucleus, correct me, someone who's a physicist might, might know better than me. I believe they're very stable. Uh, not, uh, bound quarks in nucleus, free quarks decay very quickly. They change into different things. Um, but I think in the nucleus, they're very stable. But that opens up another can of worms here. I, one of my favorite things I've ever written is an article, I titled it, We Are Less Than Dust. And what I did is I compared the atom to a solar system. Say, so let's take the nucleus and blow it up to be as big as the sun. Where are the electrons? They're 13 times farther away than Pluto. And electrons have essentially no mass, no sun, sorry, no size. So the sun and in a solar system 13 times bigger than Pluto, the next star, the next nucleus is 26 times further away than Pluto and there's nothing in between. 
you are literally 99.9999999% empty space. <laughs> we start thinking those terms and we realize what even is existence? What's reality? I mean, okay, the Bible doesn't say that Jesus walked through the wall. It says he appeared to them. But let's say Jesus walked through the wall. Was that because he was made of mist or because the wall is? <laughs> I just like to think that heaven is more real than this. We only see as but through a glass darkly. Jesus has the full picture. People who have died and gone to heaven have the fuller picture. They're not God, but they know more than we know. We are trapped in a hologram. The only reason I see you is because these photons, which we don't even know what they are, reflect off a force field of electrons that's surrounding your infinitesimal little dots called nuclei. You're an empty shadow of a person that reflects light. <laughs> and we praise God because of it. <laughs> we are less than dust on creation.com. Fun article. So this is from uh, Patrick S. Oh. Um, the uh, Zoom call. Okay. I just watched one of your videos on genetic entropy. In the video, you mentioned that we would definitely go extinct, but Jesus would return before that. The time for that is unknown, but it was a definite statement that you made about eventually we would go extinct. I, I made that statement. This is true. <laughs> would you say now that you may be wrong about the definitely go extinct because of the complexity of design, which includes error correction and redundancy. Ah, the only reason we're still alive is because of the detailed error correction and redundancy built into the genome. But we still pick up mutations every generation. Every generation is a step down from the generation before. The genome is slowly scrambling. And there are a lot of genetic mutations that are in the human population. We don't see them because they're just in one person. But that person is going to have children. And those children are going to have children. Eventually, two people get married who had the same ancestor. Anyone here with blue eyes? Your mother and father had the same ancestor. That goes back to one person in human history. There's a lot of people with blue eyes. Ooh. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, but my, three of my children have blue eyes. I'm just making a joke. I hope that was probably a bad joke. So, um, so yeah, we, I, Jesus promised he's going to come back and there's going to be people on earth when he comes back. So I don't believe he's going to come back in 3 million years because I don't think we can live that long. But the reason we persisted for thousands of years is because of the engineering in the genome. But even a perfectly engineered system is liable to break down over time. And the best engineered cars have problems. The best engineered anything, something is going to hiccup eventually. So, yeah, excellent question. Um, my question was, uh, who's talking? Oh, all right. Sorry, right here. Right here. Um, my question was, uh, can uh, genetically modified organisms or artificial ingredients, can they like change your genomes or just a cell in general in a bad way? That is a fair question and it is a fine question. Um, I'm going to answer it this way. When we genetically modify something, like these fish or the strawberries that you ate for breakfast, because most strawberries in America are genetically modified, we add a gene that produces a protein. One protein out of a few hundred thousand proteins that that organism produces. The first time you ate a banana, you ate thousands of proteins your body had never seen before. The first time you ate beef, you ate a lot of proteins your body had never seen before but we chop those proteins up in our stomach. Most all proteins are shredded to little pieces before they get into a bloodstream and then they're absorbed and turned into tissue or digested for energy. So eating something with an extra protein, if that protein is a very high concentration, it could be toxic. What we learned about um, rattlesnakes, it was a big shock. They sequence a rattlesnake genome, and they're like, where are the venom genes? There aren't any venom genes in a rattlesnake. Rattlesnake venom is 
regular old proteins in that the, the rattlesnake cells use for other things. When you take those proteins and put them on high concentration, inject them into a bloodstream, it wreaks havoc. So at high concentration, some proteins could be problematic. The one thing that, that concerns me the most is the Bt toxin. Uh, Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacterium that produces a protein and forms a crystal. And when insects eat it, it shreds the insect gut and the insect dies. Organic farmers have used Bt on organic crops for decades. It's a protein, as soon as the sun comes out, as soon as it rains, the protein is disintegrated. And yet we engineered that into something like a potato. And now every cell in that potato is expressing this at high concentrations. And yet with all the testing we've done, people aren't dropping like flies. It, they're not harming us. But it doesn't mean that one in a million people might not be harmed. Just statistically, you'll never be able to find it. Well, I think so, I was a second part to my question. Okay. Um, it sort of I did, uh, uh, it sort of ties in. Uh, my question is, uh, what exactly is a allergic reaction? What exactly is that to your genome? Um, an allergic reaction is when your body produces um, a bunch of antibodies to something and it attacks that something, it, but they, they sometimes will um, be too powerful or they get off kilter and now they're attacking your mucous membranes, like your eyes or your throat or something like that. Um, there are different types of allergic reactions. Some of them are anaphylactic, which means you're about, basically about to die. And some of them just make you go <clears throat> <clears throat> So, it's hard to say, but it, it's an immune system reaction is what it is. Our immune systems are designed to attack hundreds of thousands of foreign things every day. In fact, one of the main things our immune systems do is it attacks um, mycobacterium that live in soil, like mycobacterium leprae, mycobacterium tuberculae, as tuberculosis and leprosy, um, mycobacteria and other pathogenic microorganisms. I mean, literally, there's tetanus on my finger. It's everywhere. It's on every surface here, there are tetanus spores. Our body has to constantly deal with that or we would die very quickly. So we're tuned to do that. And now we live in this hyper clean world where we're not exposed to the things our bodies want to. And so maybe, I'm just hypothesizing here, maybe a lot of allergic reactions are our bodies are geared up to attack something. It's just the thing we're geared up to attack isn't present, so we attack the wrong thing. I could be wrong on that, though. Let's take a couple more questions and then we'll break. So. Okay. By the way, you're asking, asking some excellent questions. And we didn't have that long, awkward pause when, you know, who's going to get the first question and the one raises their hand? So this is all a lot of fun. I've got a two-part question, uh, probably pretty basic, but you mentioned the letters G, A, T, C. Yes. What, what exactly are those? Um, G, A, T, and C are chemicals. Guanine, adenine, cytosine, and thymine. That, that's it. It's, um, they're, they have circles in them, the carbon rings and, and things sticking off the carbons, and it's just, four different versions of a ringy shaped sort of carbon molecule. Okay, so when I picture like the DNA strand or whatever, it's got those letters repeating throughout it. Uh, all the G's, uh, are those gonna be the same or are they like snowflakes where one guarine or whatever no, it is? No, they're all the same. They're, all they're, the same. they're here in the middle of this. These are, they're flat molecules. And so they're actually, we're seeing them edge on. And they stick like that, and they just hide, they just hydrogen bonding, they're attracted to the other side. That's why the A's and D's are always opposite each other, and G's and C's are always opposite each other. Because of the way they line up, they fit like a not lock and a key, they're not actually touching. It's almost like they're electrostatically held together. Thank you. You're welcome. So the first dimension, when you were explaining that, you were using coding as an example yes. on how that works. Uh, so now it's more of a curious question than a genetic question, but how do you reinsert 
information into a living organism after you've like just what tools do you use for genetic engineering my genetic engineering is different than the the current genetic engineering because what i was doing 20 years ago has been superseded by crispr but there are some commonalities what i did was i took coral which is a basically a jellyfish that grows on a rock that's what coral is i scraped it off the rock with a razor blade chopped it up I added a bunch of enzymes to digest the mucus and digest the DNA. I actually did not use DNA. I got rid of the DNA. I harvested the RNA. And what I was looking for was messenger RNA that's coding for that protein. I then converted that into DNA and I added ends on the DNA that I could chop with a bacterial enzyme that chopped at a very specific place but it also, I don't want to give them the middle finger. How do I do that? Here, it, it left a, um, a long unbound, so like this is a GAAA, and then this, and it stuck off. And if I chop another piece of DNA like that, I could do that. I could stick two pieces of DNA together, then use an enzyme to join them. And I put that into a, a circular piece of DNA called plasmid that had antibiotic resistance gene on it. Then I mix that in with E. coli, and sent 100,000 volts through it. And literally goes, pow, it's a big spark. And that causes the E. coli to open up the core and suck in DNA. And then I put it on a, a bacterial plate, an agar plate with ampicillin in it. And any bacteria that did not absorb one of my, my plasmids died from the ampicillin. The ones that did had the resistance gene, they did not die. And happily, about one out of 3,000 resulting colonies was bright green because I put the messenger RNA that had no introns into the bacteria that can produce, that can process introns. And then we worked on that for a while. We took it, we cut it out with some enzymes and put it into another circular piece of DNA that had the, um, the promoter for the, um, you know that fish in Antarctica that, that goes below zero and doesn't freeze? It's called the ocean pout. It can literally be frozen in a block, in a block of ice and it's not frozen. And it produces a lot of this very repetitive protein. We took the promoter for that gene and stuck it next to the green fluorescent protein gene and we pulled out a bacteria and we injected it into fish eggs. Um, zebrafish, they, you, you ever had zebrafish at night when the lights go out, they go up in the corner and they all, they all go in the corner and go crazy. They're actually spawning. And if you have a, a tank with no, glad, no rocks on the bottom, you take a pipette and suck the eggs up. Now you have a bunch of fertilized eggs that haven't divided yet, and you can inject DNA into the eggs. Half of them will die right away. Uh, about 10% of them will show some color. And about 10% of those, maybe 1% of the total, the fish will grow up with color and the DNA will integrate into the fish's genome. So that's an inheritable trait. That's my version of genetic engineering. Amazing. Thank you. You are. And now we can genetically modify humans. That's terrifying. Oh, the, the Chinese doctor that tried that a couple of years ago, they just let him out of jail. All right, we're done? Yeah. So um, let me step down. Am I done? Okay. Yeah, but all right, let's, let's give him a round of applause. Exit through the gift shop. But you will have to stand up again pretty soon in order to answer questions privately. <laughs> so anyway, we uh, uh, let's let's adjourn. Uh, we have refreshments in back this time for some food and fellowship for the first time in a year and more than a year and a half, I think. So uh, so we've got those there and. Um, and, and, and Dr. Carter has a table with all kinds of materials on it. I encourage you to go and peruse the table and buy as much as you can. Uh, oh, and I'm speaking of that, I wanted to mention about the Creation Magazine. One of the, our favorite things about it is that they have lots of cute animals in them. So, <laughs> um, so I encourage you to, to get a subscription to that magazine. Uh, let's see. Um, Anything else? I think that should do it. So um, feel free after 
we break to come and speak privately with uh, Dr. Carter.